Hello everybody, this is Joshua with KI5SIJ, all things ham radio, batteries, and more. In this video, I'm going to cover a presentation that I put together for the local ham radio club that I'm a part of. That ham radio club is called the Crossroads Ham Radio Club out of Ganado, Texas. You can check out their website at crhrc.org. It is the initials of the club there, Crossroads Ham Radio Club, crhrc.org. This presentation today is going to go over a few things regarding uh, Raspberry Pi devices, why they crash, uh, what's the general common causes for that, and how to hopefully prevent them from occurring to you. This is mainly important for anybody using uh, All-Star or DMR type repeaters on top of Raspberry Pi devices. I know that some uh, clubs also use Raspberry Pi devices as repeater controllers, so this information may be very helpful for that purpose as well. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and get into the presentation here. The name of the presentation is A Piece of Pie, Understanding the Crashes. All right, so we'll go ahead and proceed on. All right, so uh, just a little history about me. I've been a ham radio operator since October of 2021. I'm a proud member of the Crossroads Ham Radio Club, as I previously mentioned. And you can check out their website at crhrc.org. This presentation is going to cover some of the most common issues related to Raspberry Pi devices crashes. And we'll also discuss some of the things that you can do to help reduce the possibilities of experiencing one of these crashes on your Raspberry Pi. We'll also review some of the most common troubleshooting tips that you can perform to help uh, troubleshoot your device if it crashes. Hopefully after this presentation, you'll have a better understanding of some of the more common causes related to the Raspberry Pi hardware crashes and how to possibly prevent them. All right, so the information provided in this presentation is based upon my real world experience. Some of the technical information has been obtained through my many years of providing support for a variety of different systems, including systems being developed as well as systems that are already in production, both in the professional and corporate enterprise environment. I do not claim to be an expert. However, I do want to share what I've learned over my years of experience with these devices in hopes that it may help you with some of the issues you may be experiencing or help you prevent from experiencing one of these issues. You may or may not find information on the internet that may confirm or conflict with any of the information provided here. Please keep in mind that the information I'm sharing is only solely based upon what has worked for me over the last several years. I have messed with over 60 plus of these devices over the last several years, and I've got a pretty wide uh, knowledge base on some of the more common issues. My history with the Raspberry Pi devices go all the way back to one of the first version releases of the hardware. I purchased or had the opportunity to work with many of the different models of the Raspberry Pi devices from the earliest model all the way up through the Raspberry Pi 4 Model B. The information found in this presentation also applies to other devices similar to the Raspberry Pi devices um, and the information can be used for similar purposes. I know there are some different uh, knockoff Raspberry Pi devices and they also too experience some of the same issues uh, that we're going to talk about in this presentation today. All right, so we'll get right to it. What are some of the more common causes of the Raspberry Pi crash as well? There are many different scenarios which can cause a Raspberry Pi device to crash. However, in this presentation, I'm only going to cover the top three, the top three causes that, that are the most common related causes for a Raspberry Pi device to crash. All right, and those top three are a thermal related event, poor micro SD card selection, and a power supply, whether it's faulty or not large enough to handle the load. All right. One less common cause of Raspberry Pi device crashes, and that is software issues. Uh, and while software issues do occur from time to time, they're not as common as the top three that I've listed above it here in this presentation. Hopefully after this presentation, you'll have the knowledge needed to take the, the necessary steps to prevent these types of crashes on your devices. All right, so we're going to start off by talking about the number one cause, the thermal events. All right, there are many different types of thermal events that can occur. 
and uh, I want to briefly discuss some of the more common ones, all right? So the Raspberry Pi thermal events can be caused by poor ventilation or no cooling, all right? So if you're putting your Raspberry Pi device inside of an enclosure of any type or even a, like a Raspberry Pi case, um, I'll show you what I'm talking about. I have one right here. This is a Raspberry Pi 4. It's in a little plastic case, but if you look really closely, you'll see that it has a bunch of ventilation holes on top. I actually have a fan to mount on top of this to help draw air across the chipset. It'll pull air from the bottom and, and, and push it out through the top. So I do have a fan that I plan on installing on the top of this case, which will help with ventilation. So that's kind of what I'm talking about there. All right, so if, you, if you're putting it in an enclosure, Make sure you have adequate cooling and ventilation. Most times, I would recommend using a heat sink for the CPU or chipset to assist with the cooling of the device. I highly recommend that. I uh, most definitely am for putting on the aftermarket heat sinks on the CPU and chipset. They do help. All right, so all of that covers cooling and ventilation of the Raspberry Pi device itself. The next topic below on the on the screen here is the micro SD thermal events. We're going to talk about that more in a few slides further down. I'm going to go into detail about why that occurs. But yeah, uh, micro SD, that micro SD card itself can actually experience a thermal event. And then thermal events can actually happen on power supplies too. So if the power supply is either faulty are undersized, it can cause the power supply to overheat and they can actually fail. Also, if the power supply is not providing the adequate voltage or amperage to the device, the device can overheat due to not getting the right power that it needs. All right, the thermal events listed above can typically result in a Raspberry Pi shutting off. It could even prevent it from booting up properly and sometimes can even permanently damage the Raspberry Pi device itself. I have personally experienced this before. I had a power supply one time going out and it actually took out my Raspberry Pi 3. So it can happen. All right, so we're going to continue talking more about the thermal events, specifically regarding the processor and chipset. When the Raspberry Pi device gets hot, it can cause a thermal shutdown to occur, which will result in the device powering off. In some cases, immediately after this happening, the device will not boot properly when you turn it back on. This is generally because the device is still too hot and it needs to cool off before it can be operated again. You'll need to wait for a little while so the device can completely cool before turning it back on. If you continue to power the device after it shuts down due to a thermal event, you can permanently damage the hardware. So please note that. All right, so in a real-world scenario, over the years, I had supported a series of appliances in a corporate environment which were designed around the Raspberry Pi devices. After using the devices for several weeks, I had received several reports that they were randomly shutting off, and when they would power back on, they would not boot properly. In this scenario, the people reporting the issue to me had thought that the OS itself had crashed. After I investigated the issue, I found out that the board, the Raspberry Pi device boards inside the appliances had continued to experience a thermal event due to overheating. In this particular scenario, it was a simple, a simple solution to overcome this particular issue, which was to add heat sinks on top of the CPU and the chipset. Uh, which were installed uh, directly on the chipset and processor. So installing those heat sinks directly on the, the Raspberry Pi uh, chipset and processor seemed to resolve that issue. We also took an additional step to add some case fans on that enclosure. And this was a big rack mount piece of hardware. So we added some case fans on that enclosure to push air into the case and pull air out of the case to create ventilation and airflow across the Raspberry Pi device. Once we did that, that actually resolved all of the issues. It turned out not to be an OS or file level uh, issue. It was actually a hardware thermal event occurring. So this is one real world scenario where providing some proper ventilation and cooling techniques actually resolve the issue. All right, so moving on, we're going to still continue talking about cooling and ventilation. It's very important because 
Believe it or not, this is one of the more common causes of why the device is shut down and crash. There are still a variety of cases and mounting options available for the Raspberry Pi devices. eBay and Amazon are a great source for those. When choosing a mounting option, which totally encloses the Raspberry Pi device, like the case I showed a minute ago, verify that the device has adequate cooling and ventilation within the case or the enclosure. When you place the Raspberry Pi device into a small dedicated Pi enclosure, you need to keep in mind that it may cause excess heat buildup inside the enclosure. In some cases, some enclosures are worse than others. It's always recommended to install a fan on the enclosure to help with uh, exhausting the warm air outside of the enclosure. Adding a fan will always help circulate the air across the board and reduce the heat inside the case. That is a big, big, big recommendation that I always recommend. Anybody running a Raspberry Pi device and they put it in a case, always put heat sinks on, on the chip and the processor, the chip set in the processor, and always put a fan on it if you have it inside of a Pi case. Some Raspberry Pi devices are installed in larger appliance style cases for corporate enterprise use. In these cases, I always try to make sure we have multiple fans on the enclosure. Generally recommend one or more fans pushing air into the enclosure with one or more exhaust fans pulling air and pushing it out of the enclosure. Keep in mind that the Raspberry Pi devices Properly cool will help with stability as well as prevent thermal events. When the system is running cool, it also helps extend the overall life of the hardware. Heat is electronics' worst enemy. So if your device is continuing to overheat and, and running hot, you're actually going to end up degrading and shortening the lifespan of that piece of hardware. It's been proven. And so... The cooler you can keep your device, the longer the device may actually operate for you, uh, reducing wear and tear, reducing heat thermal stress on the, on the board, and giving you added longevity to the life of the device. Heat generally causes hardware components to degrade quicker and adds unnecessary additional stresses, which shortens lifespan of the hardware. All right, still talking about thermal events, but we're going to move to micro SD card thermal events, and they do occur. I know it's not very common that people talk about this, but this is something that I have personally experienced and uh, a lot of troubleshooting and some engineers uh, working with me, and we were able to troubleshoot this issue and actually identify this. So just like uh, the thermal issues that can occur on the Raspberry Pi processor and chipset, micro SD cards can also experience thermal events as well. Micro SD thermal events are pretty common, and I'll discuss, I'll discuss why in a few slides further down the presentation. Micro SD thermal events can be caused by a couple of different issues. Below is the list of the three most common related issues directly related to micro SD thermal events. All right, so those three topics are the micro SD card is a cheaply made device or is a knockoff brand which is not reliable for its intended purpose. So we're talking about a poorly cheaply made micro SD card with poor quality. So those cheap micro SD cards that you buy on Amazon, you get what you pay for. And we'll talk about that more later on. All right. Micro SD card rated performance is inadequate for the intended use. So just like hard drives and just like other storage media, micro SD cards have a rated performance for different type cards. There's different classifications, different categorizations, and different speed and performance categories that these micro SD cards are identified by. And if you choose the wrong one for use with your application or your hardware, then it can cause uh, thermal events to occur. Raspberry Pi itself, overheating can cause the micro SD card to get hot and overheat as well. So if there's poor ventilation or cooling on the Raspberry Pi device itself, as the Raspberry Pi device starts overheating, it can actually cause the micro SD card to also overheat. Once the card reaches a certain point in heat temperature, the card will slow down and even at, at, at some point stop performing read-write functions altogether which can cause a Raspberry Pi device to crash, resulting in a micro SD thermal event. 
If the situation gets extreme, it can even cause the micro SD to even randomly unmount and disconnect from the Pi device, making it appear as though the, the micro SD card has been removed from the device. All right, so the Raspberry Pi devices depend on power. We're going to talk about thermal events, power supply issues. The Raspberry Pi devices depend on power just like all other electronics do. If the power supply is faulty, it can cause a range of issues. If the power supply is not providing the expected power, it can also cause thermal issues to occur on the Raspberry Pi board. And power can cause all kinds of system problems and generally due to under voltage, over voltage, not enough amperage capacity, etc. When these power issues occur, it can cause the Raspberry Pi device to overheat and shut down and even not boot up. So if the Raspberry Pi experiences one of these power supply issues and it shuts down, chances are when you try to power it back up, it's not going to power up correctly. All right, still talking about thermal events, and these are my recommendations on some of the things that you can do which may help prevent thermal events from occurring. The first one is to install a heatsink on your CPU and chipset on the Raspberry Pi device. I have included a link here to a heatsink kit on Amazon which has the heatsinks for the CPU and chipset for our Raspberry Pi device. All right, uh, the second one is to use a Raspberry Pi case that includes a CPU fan, which can help reduce the overall heat in the case. I've also provided a link to a Raspberry Pi 4 case, which has a fan on it, and that's just uh, for reference, and it's also a pretty decent case to use. If the Raspberry Pi device is installed in a corporate enterprise type appliance, you can ensure that the enclosure has plenty of ventilation within the case by checking for fans. Uh, if there are not fans present, I would highly recommend that you install fans, intake and exhaust fans, to create ventilation to push fresh air into the case and pull the hot air out. And then use properly paired micro SD cards for your Raspberry Pi devices. We'll explain this in the next section, but uh, properly paired micro SD cards with, uh, with hardware can cause uh, issues. So knowing exactly what type of micro SD card to purchase to pair up with your Raspberry Pi device is pretty important. We'll go over that in the next slides. All right, so we had talked about there being three different major types of uh, causes for these Raspberry Pi crashes. We just completed all the thermal event related stuff. So now we're going to talk about the micro SD card selection. This is the second topic in the presentation. There are a few different scenarios where the Raspberry Pi device or devices can crash due to a poor or incorrectly selected micro SD card. It could also be due to some other uh, reasons as well, but we'll go over all that in the next couple of slides. There are different types of micro SD cards available. When it comes to micro SD cards, they are not all the same. I always recommend to purchase a name brand card. Generally, you'll get what you pay for when you're buying micro SD cards for Raspberry Pi devices. So if you see the, the cheap package on Amazon to get five cards for 15 bucks, chances are they're not good. Uh, it's better off paying a little bit more money for these micro SD cards. You'll have less issues with them. There are different speeds. Yeah, please note that there are different speeds and different intended purposes with different levels of performance uh, for each of these micro SD cards. Some of them work better than others with the Raspberry Pi, and, and I'll go over and make some recommendations on which ones to choose uh, further in the presentation. Selection of an inadequate micro SD card could result in crashes, loss of data, failure to boot, and even uh, even thermal uh, micro SD thermal events. That's the big thing to know is that if you do not choose the right micro SD card, you could be setting yourself up for failure right out the door. Being knowledgeable about what type of micro SD card to pair with your Raspberry Pi device is key here. I'm, I'm going to say it again. I know I've said it before, but I'm going to say it again. Cheap brands do not have the quality components to withstand heat and the excessive read-write transactions, which generally result 
and an actual failure of the micro SD card itself. So we're talking about the cheaply made micro SD cards again. If you're buying a cheap brand or, or a very cheap uh, knockoff micro SD card, uh, just know that you're getting what you're paying for and more than likely you will experience a failure at one point or another, uh, generally rather quickly in my experience. So Selecting a name brand card that is properly matched to your device will help resolve this. All right, more about micro SD card selection. Inadequate or improper selection of the micro SD card could result in crashes, which we've already mentioned. Not using the correct classification or performance level of the card for the intended purpose can cause the micro SD card to overheat stop functioning, or even in some cases, self-destruct. This is a very common cause for Raspberry Pi crashes. This is the biggest note I want to focus on. The improper selection of micro SD card using the incorrect type of micro SD card almost always will result in a crash. It has happened too many times to me, and the very first thing I always check is I pull the micro SD card out, and find what the brand and model is and go look it up. And nine times out of 10, it's a cheap card. It's a, it's a no name brand, or it's not the right proper performance level type card for what we're trying to do. General failures due to excessive read write transactions occurring quicker than the device can handle. We also call that flooding or uh, saturation or exceeding the card's IO bandwidth. So we're putting a slow card into a device that can handle faster speeds. And so the Raspberry Pi device is trying to write to it at let's say 100 megabits a second, but the card can only do 50 megabits a second. So that card's not gonna get any break because it's gonna be maxed out at that full 50 for a long time while it's trying to unload all of its read write transactions to the card. So uh, choosing a card that can match or, or, or exceed what the device can do is ideal because the card will not be pushed to its full extreme of uh, a performance. And we'll talk more about that later as well. All right, so improper card selection can result in a thermal event, uh, which, we, which we explained earlier, which can cause the card to unmount or even disappear from the Raspberry Pi device, uh, which always generally results in a crash. When this happens, an immediate halt or reboot can occur. In most cases, the Raspberry Pi device will not boot up correctly after this has occurred because the card has experienced a thermal event and it needs to cool off. So just like the Raspberry Pi device thermal events, anytime either the micro SD card or the Raspberry Pi itself experience a thermal event, the key is to let it cool off for several minutes before attempting to boot it up again. In some cases, these types of issues can actually destroy the card completely and it'll no longer be usable. Uh, this seems to occur more often than not when using the off or cheap brand micro SD cards. I've actually personally have experienced that as well. All right, so still talking about micro SD cards, the thermal events. Thermal events do affect micro SD cards. And, and, and I know some of this information seems redundant, but I just want to make sure everybody understands that they can get hot and they can fail. And there's two reasons why that generally happens. Either the Raspberry Pi device is getting hot or it's improper selection of the micro SD card, poor performance, cheap brand, not properly paired SD card with the device. So we're going to talk, uh, uh, go over these few bullet points here and we'll move on. Cheaper knockoff, uh, cheaper knockoff brand micro SD cards seem to be affected more by thermal events when compared to name brand higher quality micro SD cards. Micro SD thermal events can be caused by poor ventilation. We've already talked about that on the Raspberry Pi device, but yeah, if the Raspberry Pi is getting hot, it can cause the micro SD card to get hot and then it can experience a thermal event. Sometimes crashes don't happen, but the system performance is impacted and, and performance is degraded. In some cases, the micro SD card starts getting excessively uh, slower due to all the read write transactions that it has going on. And it can actually cause the card to heat up, which can cause the performance to diminish.
And as excessive read-write transaction cause a micro SD card to heat up, it can reach a point where the micro SD card actually stops re responding totally, or it can even cause it to unmount or disconnect from the Raspberry Pi device, almost similar to as if you was to just remove the micro SD card from the Pi. I've actually seen that happen too. It got so bad that the micro SD card uh, just disappeared like it wasn't even there. This becomes an official thermal event, which causes the card to disappear from the system. It'll generally stop responding or even corrupt the content on the file system. The best way to resolve this is to purchase a higher quality brand micro SD card with higher performance rating, which would be a better pair for the device that you're putting it in. Due to the discrepancies, and we're still talking about micro card selection, Due to discrepancies in memory access speed, what we're going to talk about now is the performance and speeds and different classifications of performance and speeds of these micro SD cards. Uh, due to discrepancies in memory access speeds throughout a variety of manufacturers and brands, a set of standards were created to measure the speeds, performance, and other attributes of SD and micro SD cards. Now, I'll be honest, it's kind of confusing when you start hearing everything I'm about to talk about, but I'm going to try to keep it high level. And then at the very end, I'll explain exactly what you need for your Raspberry Pi 3 and 4 devices. So I will remove all the guesswork out of it for you. And even if you don't understand the next couple of slides I'm about to talk about, just know at the end of these slides, I do have a recommendation slide with a list of SD cards that I highly recommend and have personally tested with the uh, Raspberry Pi 3 and 4 devices. All right, so we'll continue talking about these micro SD cards. Uh, let's see, uh, SD and micro SD cards are categorized by several different aspects, such as their speed class, their bus speed, and application performance. It's just different ways to measure the, the uh, performance on the cards. SD and micro SD card classifications, speeds, and performance standards can be found at these links below. And I'll provide these in the description of the video. All right, so we're going to start off by talking uh, about bus interface. The bus interface is the physical architecture which consists of the port on the computer or device, in our case the Raspberry Pi, which has an SD or micro SD port, in our case it's a micro SD port, uh, as well as the architecture of the SD card itself. The bus interface is what controls the maximum bandwidth a device can operate at when reading or writing to an SD or micro SD card. So the bus interface is the physical piece of the hardware on the Raspberry Pi device that controls the speed in which it can talk to an SD card. To get the maximum performance, you will always want to select an SD or micro SD card with the same or better bus interface speed as the device it's going to connect into. Over the years, there have been multiple bus interfaces designed with different performance speeds, and I'll list them below. And they have different names. So the original one was around 12.5 megabits a second. This one's around 25. And then the UHS one was around 50 megs up to 104 megs. Then they came out with UHS two, which was 156 to 312 megs. And then they had the UHS-3, which is 312 to 624 megs, depending on how it's used. They also have newer technologies, but we're not going to discuss those since they do not yet apply to the Raspberry Pi device. There is no added benefit of using the newer cards that aren't listed here because the Raspberry Pi devices don't take advantage of that newer technology yet. All right, on this screen, this just shows you some of the symbols that are used to represent the different bus interfaces for these cards. So if you'll see the default speed, that's the 12.5 I was talking about. Then the high speed, that's the 25 megs. And then the UHS-1, UHS-2, and UHS-3. Those are the symbols for the bus markings that you will actually see on the actual SD or micro SD card. So when you're looking at an SD card, if you see these symbols, you can reference them with what speeds they are based upon these symbols here. All right, so we just got done with the bus interface. Now what we're going to talk about is the speed class. 
All right. So speed class provides a means of measuring a minimum expected speed. The bus, the bus interface controls the maximum speed capable. So that's saying if I'm performing at optimum speed, this is the fastest I can communicate it. The speed class is almost the opposite. It says I'm going to give you a base speed, a minimum speed that I will always operate at at my slowest speed. It gives you a way to compare the the base speed of a card, which is the slowest speed of the card that it promises it can operate at full time. So it is like the basic idle speed of the card. All right, so... Please note, to achieve maximum speed capabilities, the SD or micro SD card must be utilized on a device which is capable of supporting the max speed. All right, so to check the max speed, you'd go back to your bus interface and find out what is the fastest speed it can support. So here, I'm going to talk about the speed classes. They have it broken down into several classes. And this is where it all starts getting confusing, but I'll go over this content. I pulled a lot of this, this information directly from the standards website, which I referenced in a couple slides back, but I'm going to try to explain this the best I can. The SD and micro SD cards have multiple speed classes. I'll only list the ones below, which are actually usable on a Raspberry Pi device. We have the regular speed class, which is generally represented by a letter C with a number inside of it. And I'll talk more about that. Almost all of the newer SD and micro SD cards are a speed class of C10 or higher. Then there's UHS speed class, which is represented with the letter U symbol with a number inside of it. And then there is a video speed class, which is represented with a V symbol and a number following it. And then there's an application performance class represented by an A followed by a number. As technology progressed, the standards group added additional categories of speed classes. That's why we have several of them here listed. SD and micro SD cards can actually be classified with more than one speed class listed above. I'll show an example of this further down in the presentation. All right, so right here, this kind of goes over what we're talking about. Look at the speed class here. It's just a speed class. The first one, it's a micro SD. It has a speed class of C10 that's circled. It supports the 2 meg, 4 meg, 6 meg, and 10 meg, but it promises it can, it can operate at 10 meg there. This particular chart shows you how they can be laid out and then you'll see there's the UHS speed class, the video class. Now they got video formats classifications, but that's not really necessary to know for the Raspberry Pi devices. All right. So moving along, we're, we're done with the speed classes. Now we're going to talk about what they call application performance class. It's another way that they're measuring performance with applications on like iOS and Android devices or even Windows based devices. So I'll go over this right quick. Application performance class represented with a A symbol followed by a number is how it's represented on the actual SD cards. There's multiple different speeds available, but we're only going to talk about the A1 and A2. The A1 and A2 cards have a minimum write speed of 10 megs. So that's important to note. They have a minimum write speed of 10 megs. When Apple iOS, Google Android, Raspberry Pi, and other similar hardware all started using the SD and micro SD cards for storing data, this is when the newer category of classification came into play. The application performance class category was introduced to better measure and classify performance of SD and micro SD cards which store application application data, or even stored data, which is compiled, manipulated by applications. So what it's saying is when we started using these SD cards to store apps, app data, or even run operating systems, that's when this application performance class came into play. Just another speed class, just like the original speed class, UHS speed class, and the video speed class. It's just another way of them measuring performance. The measurement 
for the application performance class. It's measured in what they call IOPS instead of megabyte. IOPS is the measurement of input output access per second, a slightly unusual unit to what the speed of memory cards are usually measured in because we we don't measure performance like that when you're watching a file copy. You don't see it in IOPS. You see it in megabytes a second. All right, and this is just a graph of what the A1 and A2 symbols look like and their, their IOPS. But if you look over to the right, it, it'll show you that they both, A1, A2, do have a minimum sustain write speed of 10 megabytes. And on this screen, there's a quite a bit of information on here, but uh, I'll go through this really quickly. What this is, is this is the specs of a Raspberry Pi in regards to micro SD capabilities. The Raspberry Pi 3 and Raspberry Pi 4 devices are capable of the following speeds based on their bus interface bus speeds. They supposedly work with any micro SD card. However, I will, <laughs> I will make emphasis that some SD cards work better than others. As I previously mentioned, make sure you don't cheap out on your micro SD card because you will pay the price for that. Let's look at what the Raspberry Pi device prefers as far as SD card and performance. Uh, it supports the UHS-1 based micro SD cards. So if it'll support the UHS-1 based micro SD cards, that means the two and three cards will also run on it as well. But it's looking for a minimum of a UHS-1 based micro SD card. These are the bus speeds that the Raspberry Pi 3 and 4 devices can operate at. It looks like it can operate at all the way up to 104 megs on the SDR104. You can use an SDHC1 and an SDXC1 type micro SD card, but I would highly recommend looking for an A1 or A2 class card. You'll experience faster speeds with an A1 or A2 class micro SD card. However, please note the Pi cannot fully utilize the full bandwidth and performance of an A2 style card since the technology and the speed of the Raspberry Pi devices cannot operate at those speeds. However, I will tell you that using a faster speed card on a Raspberry Pi 3 or 4 does help ensure that the card will stay cooler and you will not be pushing the card to its full capabilities on its read write transactions. So it's been my personal experience that when I use a faster base card on a Raspberry Pi 3 or 4, the card stays cooler. The micro SD card is never pushed to 100% of its capability speed performance wise. So therefore, you're going to lengthen the life of the card. It should be less likely to overheat. And the card itself should never be degraded in performance due to excessive uh, I.O., excessive read and write or excessive heat. So all around, you're going to be better off using a faster card on a Raspberry Pi 3 or 4 device because it's going to run cooler and it's going to be more stable. Here is the recommendation slide for micro SD selection. I told y'all that I, I had this in here. I want to go over it. There's two slides here. I'm just going to kind of go over some of this information one more time. I know some of it's going to be a repeat, but this is where I'm going to explain. You don't need to understand all the past gibberish I've talked about, about the different classifications of speed, uh, the bus architecture and all that. Right here, I'm going to explain exactly what you need to look for as far as a micro SD card. Uh, based upon my personal experience, as well as research and my work with some other computer engineers, here are some recommendations for me. Selecting a micro SD card based upon the specs below should give you the best chance at achieving the most stable experience with your Raspberry Pi device. This should prevent some of the more common micro SD thermal issues, as well as prevent random shutdowns and boot up issues that are generally related directly to micro SD cards. I have yet to experience any corrupt disk issues or boot up issues when using the recommended micro SD cards that I'm going to show you on the next slide. Keep in mind with the speed class, you always want to use a class 10 card, which is generally represented with a C and a number 10 inside of it.
Also look for the UHS-1 class identification as well, represented by a single one symbol. Newer UHS classes will work, but there will be no added benefit as far as performance is concerned. Any micro SD card with an A1 or A2 classification would also be preferred as it will generally provide faster speeds. Keep in mind, you can use a UHS-3 or UHS-2 card, but as I previously mentioned on the previous slide, you're not going to be pushing that card to its full performance capabilities because it's a faster card on a device that does not yet provide speeds at that level. But what that does do is it keeps the card cooler, it keeps the card stable, and it provides you a longer life on that micro SD card since you are not pushing it to its full capabilities. All right, and as far as speed, you're looking for a micro SD card that can do at least 50 megs a second, 50 megabits a second, through 105 megabits a second read and write speed so that it's best paired with the capabilities of the Raspberry Pi device. In the micro SD type, SDHC1 or SDXC1, both of those will work. On this screen, here is a list of the cards that I personally recommend. I have tested these, I have messed with these, I've had least amount of issues with these. I've included the uh, read and write speeds here. These actually pair up properly with a Raspberry Pi 3 or 4 device. My personal preference, the ones that I buy for use on my own devices, is the Samsung Evo or the Samsung Evo Plus cards. They cost a little bit more than the other cheapo cards, but I have never had one fail on me. Knock on wood. <laughs> uh, tomorrow or today it may happen, but it's never happened to me yet. So I've had some that I've been using for a very long time and I've never had an issue. So the Samsung, this Samsung right here, the Samsung Evo, Evo Plus, that's the cards I would recommend. The last couple screens, I'm going to go over some troubleshooting tips. The power supply, there was another section in this, in this presentation about power supplies. We did kind of cover that though under the thermal event area, but I'm going to just talk it right quick. Power supplies that are inadequately paired with the Raspberry Pi devices can cause issues. A Raspberry Pi device likes a 5 volt, 3 amp power supply. If you're using a 5 volt, 1 amp or anything less, or if you're using a 5 volt and 2 amp or anything less, chances are you're going to experience issues. I highly recommend finding a 5 volt, 3 amp power supply at minimum to power your Raspberry Pi device. Especially, this is even more so true if you have anything USB or any type of Raspberry Pi hat running on top of the Raspberry Pi device. You may can get by with a 5 volt, 2 amp power supply as long as you are not running any USB devices or any Raspberry Pi hat devices on the Raspberry. But I can tell you at minimum, I recommend, always recommend at minimum, a 5 volt, 3 amp power supply for the Raspberry Pi devices. Whether or not you're using USB, any Pi hats or anything, you generally cannot go wrong with a 5 volt, 3 amp power supply. When a power supply goes bad, it can cause the Pi to overheat, it can cause thermal events, it can cause it to crash, it could cause it not to boot, it could cause it to lock up. Uh, I've seen all kinds of things happen due to poor power supply. So keep in mind that a, a inadequately paired or a failing power supply can cause very similar issues as to what you would experience with a thermal event. I highly recommend making sure you have a very good power supply. So the last couple of screens, I'm just going to go over some rough troubleshooting tips, and then we'll be at the end of the presentation here. We'll wrap up the video. So Raspberry Pi rebooted on its own, and let's see, the Raspberry Pi rebooted on its own, but then it booted up successfully. Well, if this happens to you, try replacing the power supply with a known good power supply and see if the issue ever happens again. It could be that during operations of that Raspberry Pi, it may have hit a peak or it may have hit a load, a processing load where the CPU caused it to pull a little bit extra power and the power supply could not handle that. And whenever it hit that peak in power usage, it could have 
hit a, a thermal event or a power event, which caused it to reboot due to not having the adequate power needed to do what it was trying to do. So replacing it with a good known power supply, I'll again say a five volt, three amp power supply minimum may resolve that issue. If you do, if you replace the power supply and the issue continues, I would recommend taking a look at the micro SD card. Even try taking that micro SD card and putting it inside of another Raspberry Pi device that you know is working properly and test it and see if it works in another a Raspberry Pi device. It could be that your SD card is failing or it's having a thermal event in that particular Raspberry Pi device. If that micro SD card works fine in another Raspberry Pi device, then chances are your thermal issues are hardware related with the original Raspberry Pi device. So that's where you would go and look at trying to create a better cooling situation for your Pi device. I would highly recommend purchasing and installing a heat sink and cooling kit for your Pi device as it may resolve the issue. A good heat sink kit, you can get them on Amazon or eBay for your Raspberry Pi 3 or 4. Buy an enclosure that has a fan on it. Now, I will say something I didn't talk about is some metal cases actually have it set up to where the case is the heat sink itself. I actually have one of these and they actually work very well. It's a metal enclosure and it has a contact pad where the CPU and the chipset actually make contact with the top of the case and that case dissipates the heat very well. That case is always generally warm to the touch, but the pie itself actually runs pretty cool inside the enclosure. So if you find a case like that, that may work as well. I would still put a case fan on the top of that case to help keep that case cool though. All right, so let's go over another scenario. A Raspberry Pi crashed and has an issue when booting up. Well, chances are you're experiencing a thermal event. It might be a Raspberry Pi thermal event, or it could be the micro SD thermal event. It could even be a power supply thermal event. Turn the device off and let it rest for 15 to 20 minutes. If the device or the micro SD is experiencing a thermal event, it just needs to cool off before you try using it again. So let it cool off for an adequate amount of time and then try turning it on and see if you get a different result. If you're still having issues, let's go back and check the brand model and speed classification on the micro SD card and make sure it is fast enough and make sure it is properly paired with the Raspberry Pi specs. If it's too slow or is not a recommended brand name, then I would highly, highly, highly recommend replacing the micro SD card with a name brand micro SD card, preferably one of the ones that I provided on my recommendation list. If the Raspberry Pi still doesn't boot, then I would try taking the SD card and placing it into another Raspberry Pi and see if it boots on a different device. If it works on a different device, then it's confirmation that you may be having an issue with the Raspberry Pi hardware itself or the power supply. Put the micro SD card back into the original device and try replacing the power supply with another good power supply and see if you get the same result. That'll help you narrow down whether it was the Pi device or the power supply itself. Your card may be corrupted due to improper shutdown. If that's the case, it doesn't matter which device you put your micro SD card in, you'll get the same result. It'll act like it's going to boot and then it locks up or it fails. All right, so I had a situation where I had an old Raspberry Pi that stopped reading the micro SD data port. However, I had to have a micro SD card in that slot for it to turn on. I believe it was an old Raspberry Pi 3. So I'm going to talk about what I did to continue using that Raspberry Pi. I was thinking outside the box. I actually found a USB thumb drive that had very good performance on it. And what I did is I took a blank micro SD card or took a micro SD card and formatted it, put it into the micro SD card slot on the Raspberry Pi so it would at least turn on. And then I used a USB thumb drive to load my OS on. Now, I knew this was going to work because I've loaded Raspberry Pi OS on a thumb drive before. I just wasn't sure if it was going to work having that micro SD card in there. But yes, it worked. I left a formatted micro SD card in the micro SD slot, used a USB thumb drive with the Raspberry Pi OS on it, 
boot it up and uh, I still have that device running like that almost four or five years later. So that particular configuration actually worked out well in the event your micro SD slot stops working. Don't panic. You can boot up. You can put your OS on a thumb drive, boot up on a thumb drive and use it just like a micro SD card and still get what you need out of the Raspberry Pi device. So when it comes to micro SD and Raspberry Pi devices, when you run into an issue, sometimes you got to think outside the box. USB thumb drives is an alternate solution in place of a micro SD card. In the event you want to use a thumb drive, I would just recommend using a USB 2.0 or 3.0 thumb drive, depending on which Raspberry Pi you're using. If you're a Raspberry Pi 4, use a USB 3 thumb drive. You'll get better performance out of it. All right. And then the very last slide, the very last slide here. These are my final thoughts. Well, I want to say thank you for watching my video. If you like the video, please give me a thumbs up. Please subscribe to my channel as I'm hoping to release many more videos like this one regarding the ham radio hobby. We're going to be having some videos regarding battery building and other technology related stuff. Uh, we, we do some proof of concept builds on some product ideas that I have and DIY builds and more. Please check out our website, hambatteries.com. Hamabatteries.com is the website. This is what it looks like. We have some hotspot, some all-star and DMR hotspot battery boxes so that you can use your all-star and battery boxes mobile or have a UPS type solution for your hotspot in the event you lose power. We sell these hotspots directly from our website here at hambatteries.com. Also, check us out on Facebook, hambatteries.com. At hambatteries is our handle there on Facebook. Feel free to join us on Facebook. We'd love to have you join. Uh, we'd love to have you subscribe. And uh, please check back for more content very soon. 73, everybody.